Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,422. Say what you mean and mean what you say. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. What's the worst thing for your car's interior? No, it's not that milkshake the kids spilled in the back seat. It's the sun. Harmful UV rays cook your automobile's interior hour after hour when it's parked outside, even on a cloudy day. What's the solution? Covercraft sunscreens. They protect your dash, seats, and interior finishes from those damaging UV rays while keeping the interior temperature tolerable, even on the hottest summer days. No more painfully sizzling seats and steering wheels for you. They unfold quickly and easily install, stay where you put them, and are custom pattern for an exact fit. The foam core acts as a cooling insulator, and you can get yours in different colors and finishes. And they even fold up easily and store under your seat or on the floor. I've used Covercraft sunscreens for years, and they are a fast and easy solution that protect my beloved cars when they're not in the garage. Learn more and order yours at Covercraft.com. Want to protect your entire vehicle? Get a car cover from Covercraft. They have those too. That's Covercraft.com. And tell them Mark sent you. My favorite collector car magazine is Keith Martin's Sports Car Market. I've been a subscriber for decades. Sports Car Market is the Wall Street Journal for the enthusiast and the collector. It's your monthly must-read whether you dream of owning a collector car have two cars or 200. Sports Car Market has been around for 31 years and it's filled with valuable articles, intelligent write-ups, and the latest auction sales. Go to sportscarmarket.com and subscribe today. Plus, you'll get the exclusive SEM guide to restoration shops included for free. At checkout, use the code CARSYA and receive a 50% discount on your digital subscription. It's an exclusive offer from me here at Cars Yeah. I'm Mark Green, and I love Sports Car Market Magazine. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I'm revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest calling in from beautiful Carmel, California, Mike Gallette. Mike, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Yeah, Mark, I'm here. All right. Mike Gallette is the founder of MyCarQuest.com, a blog he started in 2010. There he writes about classic cars, race cars, automobiles of interest, and the people who made and drive these fascinating vehicles. MyCarQuest.com is a view from the perspective of the collector, the enthusiast, and the lover of classic and collectible cars. Mike has more than 30 years experience in the technology business sector, with 15 years as either the president and CEO or president and COO of many companies. He has been through three initial public stock offerings, several mergers, the acquisitions, and has experience in both public and private companies. He earned a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Dayton. So, Mike, I've told our listeners just a tiny bit about you. Before we jump into the questions, could you take a brief moment and share a little bit more about your life, your career, and a very obvious passion that you have for automobiles? Sure. After I left the technology business in uh, 2010, I started my car quest as a way to stay connected with car people because, you know, when you own cars, whether it's uh, show cars or cars you drive or race cars, there's only so much you can do with them on a daily basis. So by writing my blog, my car quest, I actually get involved in the collector and classic car activities on a daily basis. And I've met so many interesting people from around the world through the internet, not all of them in person. I've also introduced many people to each other through various stories about cars or car models or even specific cars. I've reintroduced family members who haven't seen each other for years. And I've introduced other people who are looking for a specific car all through the wonder of the internet. These connections are something that just keeps me going. I just love it. Um, My car quest has over 2,000 posts in the last nine years. We have thousands of readers, and I won the Silver Automotive Heritage Award this year for the best blog or column. Well, congratulations. You know, 
This is a great story, and this is why I wanted to have you on the show. And a shout out to our mutual friend, Cindy Meidel, for connecting us and introducing us. Thank you, Cindy. Someday I'm going to convince her to be a guest on this show. But the thing that you've touched on here is really important, and I think it's of great value. Some people, when they they have success in business and say they sell companies, and then they kind of go off and relax, or I I won't use the word retire, because to me, that is the same as just kind of fading into the sunset. But they still want to be connected. They want to stay out there. And we live in a time right now that you can, for virtually nothing, stay connected and be involved and share. And I think the most important part of what you just shared with us here is the connections you make and how you connect with people. Cars in this car hobby are really about the people. I always say the cars are just the catalyst that bind us together. So congratulations on that award. We're going to learn a lot more about my car quest. But first, I want to ask you for a success quote or a mantra. Some kind of saying that's been instrumental in forming your life and your success. It's a nice way to get the inspirational tires turning air on cars. Yeah, so Mike, take the wheel. Okay, well, I, I've got two of them. The first one is say what you mean and mean what you say. <laughs> and the second one is always be on time. Uh, yeah, two things that are really important to me for sure. I was just having this talk with Mike. My wife the other day, uh, she's having some challenges with people that aren't on time. And I remember I ran a company for 20 plus years and I can't tell you how many alarm clocks I bought and gave as gifts to remind people, you know, it's not that hard to be on time. But for some people, it is. What's with that? I don't know. But uh, that one company (laughs) I was at, the meeting was so uh, notorious for being late. I used to shut the door and lock it. Uh, at the meeting I time, the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure I recommend that as a as a method, but it gave it gave people the message that being on time was important because if you're late, you're wasting the time of a lot of other people in the room. Yeah, you know, I used to think of it as akin to being disrespectful to others. That's uh, right. Because when you're late and you make others sit around, and it's the same when you come into a meeting and you have your phone in your hand and you're looking at your phone versus being there and present. Uh, we could have a whole show about uh, etiquette with phones these days and, and being present in talks and so forth. But the other part of your mantra here is do what you say, say what you mean. Uh, give me maybe an example of the importance that holds for you. Well, it filters out the people who are disingenuous and who may um, say things about someone or maybe an idea, a business strategy that they don't really mean, and then later they don't support the idea, They, if they would have just said it up front, it would have been more successful uh, for, for everyone. And, and naturally, I'm using this in the context of the business world where I spent 35 years. In. And so I worked with I worked with a lot of people who didn't say what they meant and didn't say what, what they said, and that just made everybody else's job that much more difficult. Plus, you lose respect for that person once you figure out that they weren't being honest with you. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, something when I was younger, my dad told me, and of course, we've all heard this, walk your talk, Um, you know, do as you say, and uh, always stand behind those words. So uh, I love it. It's great. Well, let's talk about your personal passion for cars. Although you worked in tech for many, many years, You've been a car guy for a long time, I suspect. Tell us about a pivotal moment in your life when you knew you were indeed going to be a car guy for life. Working full-time and getting involved with with having fun with cars was a part-time obsession at the time. But, you know, I'm not sure that there was actually a moment I knew I was a car guy. It just sort of snuck up on me, probably around age 9 or 10. I lived in uh, Los Angeles at the time. I built model cars. I read all the magazines. I looked at the cool cars on the streets of LA. I went to local car shows in the parks, which are very prevalent down there. I helped my dad work on cars because my dad was was a car lover, although he couldn't afford to own the cars that he wanted, but he worked on the ones he did have. You know, it just sort of snuck up on me. And then in LA as a kid, Going back and forth to school, I saw brand new Shelby Cobras and GT350 Mustangs on the streets, read about them in the magazine. So I got excited about those cars and and Shelby himself. My dad was a truck driver. He delivered to the Shelby factory and he was able, he was able to 
And one of my big regrets in life is I didn't talk him into giving me a visit down there because I'm sure I could have arranged that somehow. I wasn't smart enough at the time, but he brought home from his uh, dealings with the guys on the shipping dock, uh, uh, Cobra factory posters, Cobra shirts, Cobra decals, and he brought them all home to me and they've all been used up. I still have a Shelby factory postcard from 1965 introducing the the Cobra 427. Uh, The Shelby poster that I had, the factory poster, got lost when I went away to college. But several years ago, I found another one exactly like the one I had that my dad gave me, and I was able to buy it, and I have it framed. It's hanging on my office right now. <laughs> nice by, memory. By the, yeah, so it's it's a nice memory. I wish I had the original one, but it's exactly the same. And I also, yeah. I also have one Cobra decal from 1965 that my dad got from the Shelby factory. It's on a skateboard that I built, and it's permanently attached to the skateboard. But that's the only memento I have left from all of those decals I had, because as you can imagine, they got attached to anything <laughs> that they would stick to, which are long of gone course. now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Who'd have thought? Well, it's a great memory and a great thought. Yeah, the fact that your dad would go to the show before, oh my gosh, that would, yeah. have been, that would have been pretty cool to go and meet old Shell. Well, let's talk about a challenge that you may have faced uh, down the way. Now, you've been involved in a lot of companies that went through IPOs, acquisitions. Uh, certainly, you faced a lot of challenges, maybe it's a failure or two. I would like for you to talk about one in particular, kind of take us there. But more importantly, what was the lesson learned from that so that somebody listening that might be going through the same thing could learn that, you know what, there is a good lesson to learn from these experiences that help you gain more momentum as you move forward in your life and your business and your career? Well, if, if we want to talk about some of my um, disappointments in business, I mean, that could take up the whole show. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. that's why I say just one. But, you know, I, I love the fact that you started that way, because that tells me something about you here, Mike, that uh, you're not afraid of failure, uh, that you take risks, you take challenges, because that's yeah. how you achieve things. Yeah. So I, I, I thought about this question, and I think it goes all the way back to the very beginning of my career. I dropped out of graduate school to take a high-paying job as an engineer. And I bought a new Triumph TR6, and maybe I would have been better off if I would have stayed in graduate school. Sometimes I think about that. However, I worked hard in my career in the technology business. I was aggressive. I I had some talents. I was a good engineer. I was a a good manager. And in the end, it all turned out okay without... um, finishing graduate school. So I, you know, I would say some, sometimes I have that as a, as a regret, but at the end of the day, it, uh, it, it all came out okay. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I tell you, my son, when he was getting into his senior year between junior and senior year, he got recruited by Google. And I remember him calling me, he went to school on the East Coast. I live out here on the West Coast. And he said, Dad, I got a job offer from Google. I'm like, well, that's great. That's great. That'll be great when you graduate. No, they want me to start now. And I went, whoa, 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 big fella. <laughs> I said, no. Uh, and now I was paying for a very expensive college education and had been private schooling and so forth. And I said, I really believe you'll never forgive, forgive yourself if you don't finish college. You, you come this far. And he went to a very challenging college. I said, don't worry. Here's how we're going to stay in touch with the school or with Google so you can get a job. Well, he did. He ended up getting uh, hired out of his uh, senior year, uh, I think three days after graduation, he jumped on a plane and moved to San Francisco, and he's worked there ever since. Very proud of him, of course. But let me ask you this, because it's something that a lot of people I've talked to over the past, they go, oh, if I just stayed with it a little bit longer. Now, in your case, obviously, it worked well. You've been successful and all that. But there's still that lingering thought, I can tell. After all these years in your head, what if, what if? So what advice would you give a young person that might be in those same shoes right now? Uh, I would say that there is a certain level of, of minimum education that I think is is required, and I would say a minimum of bachelor's degree. So, like the advice you gave your son, finish that degree up, and and then and then take a look because once you take a break from from college, it's it's very difficult to go back. Uh, if, if you know if you if you go out working. Uh, making money for four or five years and building your career 
and you get out of all of the habits of studying and taking tests and then to say, well, I'm going to stop working and go back and, and finish graduate school. That's a really challenging thing to do. You're much better off going all the way at the time. But, you know, graduate school is not necessarily for everybody. So if you're happy, there is a point you can stop and still have a successful career. And I've always said a bachelor's degree is a magic key into the, uh, the business world or the technology world. And of course, there are lots of examples of very successful entrepreneurs that didn't finish their college or even go to college. But those are uh, the exception rather than the rule. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you, Mike, um, I met my wife in college. Uh, We were both going to UCSD. She was an engineering student. And she used to say she was a mechanical engineering major. And she used to say, well, those engineering majors, uh, the, the electrical engineering majors, those are the really smart guys over there. And I always look at her. She's a very smart woman. I always say, you mean there's people smarter than you? She's, oh, those are the real brains over there. So you're you're in high esteem with my wife as a fellow engineer. Let's uh, have a little bit of fun and talk about your first really special vehicle. You, You already mentioned that Triumph, but the first special car in your life and maybe share a memory you have about that ride. So for all the years that I owned cars, while I was working, I owned cars like the TR6 and later Porsche 911s. I owned cars that I drove. At some point, I fell in love with the Bucerini GT5300. And that that was a really special car to me. It took me uh, four and a half years to find one because they're rare cars. Most of them are in Europe, and I live in California. And I started searching in the early 2000s, and I finally found the perfect car for me and bought it in 2008. And this was a a wonderful driving car, but it also uh, had an exterior restoration. The interior was original. Uh, the exterior had been restored to a pristine condition. So it was a it was a show car. And it just stopped everybody in their tracks every time I drove that car onto, uh, onto a show field. And I had a lot of great conversations standing next to that car at various events, uh, including little kids coming up to me, some who knew what it was. Almost everybody who walked up to the car had no idea what it was. And so I got the opportunity to to describe the car and give the history and explain why uh, that car was so special. That, to me, was just a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, meeting uh, kids like 12 and 13-year-old kids who just wanted to hear the engine start. and um, other people who were like older, you know, gentlemen who were lifelong car guys and walking up and go, I have never even heard of this car before. So now now I think more people know what a Bizzarini is. And I say maybe in some part because of my blog, the silver Bizzarini is actually the logo on my blog. And I've written a lot about it. I've shown it up and down the coast. Uh, that car won. Uh, the only B. Serini class at the Quail and Motorsport Gathering, uh, I was the winner of that class, or I should say my car was the winner. I was in 2000, 2012, and it's been to every other major show in uh, California, with the exception of Pebble Beach, and uh, met Jay Leno the first time I took it to a show down in L.A., spent 20 minutes talking with him, and I met a lot of other interesting people and car lovers just by sitting next to this beautiful car. And of course, it was a blast to drive, too. Yeah, no kidding. Love that car. Giotto Bizzarini, designer of that car. And what makes that car so special, for those of you who may not know it, and you can Google it and look it up, American Power uh, Chevrolet. It has a small block, right? A 327 yeah, Corvette three, engine in it? 327 Corvette, yeah. And, yeah, the, the, and the, the, as long as you mention the engine, it's, it's uh, important to know where the engine's located. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's like right next to you. It's, it's, <laughs> it's way back. <laughs> it's pretty much in the middle of the of the car. It's the definition of front and an engine placement. It sits so far back in the car that the uh, dashboard has a access panel that you remove to look at the uh, and access the distributor cap. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a stunning car, and, and what's really cool about it is it's these 
some of these mini cars like the um, the Iso Grifo, the Iso Revolta, which are U.S. engine powered, beautiful Italian design cars. Uh, to me, this car looks like a beautiful Italian car, and then somebody just compressed it down to kind of get it lower to the ground, almost Mura esque in a way. But I got to spend a day with a friend of mine from the Pacific Northwest. You might know him, Bill Cotter, who had one that he raced for many years, and uh, we got to shoot that car for the day. I've got a great picture of my son sitting in that car when he was in junior high, I think. I'll have to send that to you. But Nice car. That's a great car. What a very, very special first car. Do you have a seller's remorse story, though? A car you've let go that you wish you still had? Yeah, there, there's two. Actually, I wrote an article on, on my car quest about seller's remorse. Uh, that article was specifically about my 68 Iso Grifo. Ah, okay. Although I do, I do have serious remorse also about this Pizzerini, which I sold a few years ago. My first Iso Grifo was, was a car that my wife also loved. It was a wonderful uh, driving car. It was not a show car, but it was a very comfortable, very fast driver. And because of its lack of perfection in the cosmetics, we would just drive it and, and not worry about road dings and rocks and that sort of thing and just have a blast. And, and so I, I sold that one a few years ago, had seller's remorse, so I went out and bought another one, but it wasn't quite the same. <laughs> I imported my second Grifo. I imported it to California from, from Europe, and it was a pristine show car, uh, but it wasn't quite the same. It didn't have the same exact feeling and driving experience or headroom as the first Grifo had. And even more importantly, my wife didn't like it. She loved the first one, but not the second one. So, yeah, there's some serious seller's remorse there. Well, we all have those stories, so uh, don't worry. I've got about 1,421 right behind you. So, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, I would love for you to share a lot more about MyCarQuest.com, this blog that you started, what it's all about, how people can access it, what's uh, fun about it, what makes you proud about it. So, tell our listeners about MyCarQuest.com. Okay, so so it's uh, it's on the internet, mycarquest.com. It's also a free email subscription where you'll get an email only if a new blog post is is posted. But it's not necessary to do that. You can just go and and look at uh, uh, the latest blog postings. And I love posting articles that get attention, even if I don't write them. I have uh, other people who write articles uh, for me. And the biggest kick I get is introducing people to each other or reintroducing people who maybe knew each other before but haven't seen each other for a while. And this is all over the Internet, so they can then decide uh, whether they want to meet or talk on the telephone to each other. But on a regular basis, I uh, I see people in the comments section uh, meeting each other as they're searching for a car, somebody whose father used to race a certain race car, and we write an article about it. That person comes on and goes, my dad or my uncle used to drive that car, and then they want to know more about it. Uh, or I'll get a private email from a reader who would like to be introduced to another reader um, because they're looking for something or information, or they just want to talk to the person. And I meet people from all over the world who read my car quest, either through the comment section or, or by email. And sometimes I meet them in person. Uh, I've had Several experiences were similar to this one. At last, you know, say at, in 2018 at the Quail uh, Motorsport Gathering, I was showing my Lamborghini Espada uh, as we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Espada. And a, a gentleman from um, Brazil came up to me with his father, and we stood there and talked for about 20 minutes about his Espada, because he was restoring his Espada in Brazil. And so he naturally loved to talk to someone who actually had an Espada and look at one. And after we talked for about 20 minutes and it was time uh, to move on, I handed him my business card, which is the logo of my car quest. And he looked at it and his eyes got big and he goes, oh, my God. He goes, I read my car quest every day. So <laughs> he's and he's in Brazil. You already knew each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he didn't recognize my face, but he recognized the logo on my card. And yeah. so that's happened to me about probably about four or five times over the last few years, that sort of situation. It's just to me, that's the biggest thrill for somebody you to, know, see, it is. to see the card. Yeah. And you probably have the same experience. 
Yeah, yeah, it's happened many times. In fact, I was on an airplane once sitting in the back and there was three seats. I was on the edge and uh, the the aisle there and uh, the gentleman next to me saw me pull out a car magazine. Oh, you like cars? And we started talking and his wife leaned over and said, you're the Cars Yeah guy, right? <laughs> and, and then she looked at him. She goes, you listen to him every day. And he's like, oh, my gosh, you're Mark Green. So, yeah, it's fun. You know, this, I, I said that at the beginning, and you mentioned it as well, this car fascination we have and, and the fact that we can reach out now very easily. I mean, it's easy to create websites these days. It's easy to reach out. It's easy to connect with people and share things. So uh, I love that's what you're doing with MyCarQuest.com. Check it out. You can subscribe. I subscribe today. Uh, so you can get these uh, nice, uh, wonderful blog messages from Mike. Mike, up next is the last lap. Before we put the pedal to the metal, let's say thank you to today's Cars Yeah sponsors. When you want proven performance, there's one brand that's been around since 1938. That's Edelbrock, building the finest American-made performance products for the street and track. Edelbrock's products are designed and dyno-proven to deliver maximum results. Edelbrock has thousands of made-in-the-USA performance products for all makes and models. From their new ADS-2 carburetor and innovative ProFlow 4 EFI for your muscle car or truck. To superchargers for your daily driver and more, visit edelbrock.com to check out the latest products for your ride and when you're ready to check out enter cars yeah in the coupon code and get 10 percent off your order that's edelbrock automotive performance since 1938 you take care of your cars but who takes care of your investments tune-ups aren't just for engines updating your financial plan is important too your GPS may take you from A to B, but it won't help you on the road to financial freedom. For that, you need a good co-pilot and a very trusted advisor. Chris Kimball, CFP, is just the man for the job. He'll guide you down that road without driving you crazy. For over 25 years, Chris has helped people just like you and me with their financial planning and investments. With a master's degree in financial services, he is eminently qualified, and he's a car guy too. Learn more at chrisvkimble.com or call 866-ON-A-PLAN. Securities through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Member FINRA SIPC. CK Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Are you looking for a way to get your products or services into the ears of thousands of automotive enthusiasts around the globe? I can help. This is Mark Green here at Cars Yeah, and I'd be honored to be an influencer and ambassador for your brand in a unique and personal way. Five days a week, thousands of subscribers and listeners enjoy the Cars Yeah podcast and website. Contact me today and I'll show you how at mark at carsyeah.com or connect with me through the Cars Yeah website at carsyeah.com. Okay, Mike, we are back, and I have a bit of an introspective question. I'm going to get into your head a little bit here. If you woke up tomorrow and you were a car, what would Mike be and why? Well, as you can imagine, that's a difficult question after <laughs> pondering it for a while. I, I think I think the only answer would be a, a Niso Griso, because a Niso Griso is good-looking and comfortable. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> Well, we are entering the last lap, and I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some quick blips of the ESO Grifo throttle. So here we go. What's the best automotive advice you've ever received? When you're searching for a car and you and you decided you wanted to buy a certain model, I think the best advice I've heard, which I try to follow, is buy the best example you can afford as opposed to buying one at a cheap price that needs a little fixing up. There's no such thing as a little. Yeah. Would you share one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your many successes over the years? Uh, I have a, an attention to detail, uh, which I think is important, whether you're running a technology company or writing or publishing a blog. Uh, my attention to detail, I think, has uh, done a lot of good for me in my, my life and my career. And the other one I said earlier is be on time. You, you know, the, the being late is just the lack of showing a lack of respect for other people and wasting other people's time. So those are personal Absolutely. habits I've developed over the years that I try to stick to. How about a resource that you think our listeners would enjoy? <laughs> MyCarQuest.com. There you go. Yeah, that's okay. Self, self-support self is fine here on Cars. Yeah, I was hoping you'd say that. Now, if I could sit down and arrange for you to have a drink or a meal with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would it be? Okay, that's 
actually an easier question for me than it, than it sounds like. I think a lot of people would have a tough time with that question. But but for me, the person that came to my mind, that's Lance Reventlow. Okay. Tell our listeners a little bit about who he is. Lance, Lance Reventlow has one of the most fascinating histories in the car world, I think, uh, that I've ever uh, read about. Actually, I've written about him, too. You can find a couple articles about him and his race cars, the scare up on my car quest. But he was uh, born into wealth and into royalty, grew up in uh, the Hollywood area, and fascinated by by racing, visited uh, your uh, English uh, race car companies and decided he could build his own, came back to California and hired some of the best people in the sports car racing world at the time, including, uh, you know, Phil Remington and a handful of other fascinating people, built the Scarab race cars, built it into, in the late 50s, the most successful front engine uh, sports car racing in, in the world. And they beat all of the European cars that came over here, Ferraris or Maseratis. They all came over here to race, and the, and the Scarabs were hands down the, the best race car. He was funding all of that through his, uh, his mother's inheritance, who was... Um, uh, inheritance or the, the heir to the uh, Woolworth Hortons fortune, uh, Bar- Barbara, Barbara Hutton. Barbara yeah. Hutton. Yeah. So he lived his whole life in, in the public spotlight because of his his family. But but he was also a, a tremendous individual that uh, that did some great stuff and then uh, great stuff in car racing. And he never built street cars. He he was different than Carroll Shelby. He built cars just to race. I think there were only like eight Scarab cars built, including three ill-conceived uh, Formula One cars. So because of that, uh, he eventually was running out of the, the finances and maybe getting into some tax problems because he was never going to make a profit. He decided to get out of racing and basically handed over his entire operation, facilities, equipment, and people to Carroll Shelby. Carol Shelby then stood on Lance Reventlow's shoulders and built the Cobra Empire, which went on to win uh, great racing uh, uh, success, even beyond what what Reventlow did. But a lot of the people facilities, even the transporters, were uh, Reventlow transporters that Shelby took over and just repainted them with the Shelby Shelby livery. Anyway, so unfortunately, uh, Lance. Uh, died uh, at age 32 in an airplane wreck in uh, Aspen, Colorado. Oh, yeah, Aspen, Colorado. Yeah, if I yeah. remember right. Yeah, in- incredible story. Uh, interesting that you chose him because uh, I- no one's mentioned him out of all the 1,400 plus people who've been on the show. But um, yeah, his grandparents, of course, uh, Franklin Hutton and Edna Woolworth, the Woolworth fortune. So uh, he was born with a bit of a, uh, a platinum spoon in his mouth, but a very interesting guy of what he built, what he did. And that connection to Shelby uh, is fascinating. So, yeah, he would be a tr- very cool guy to eat with. On a personal basis, one of his stepfathers was Cary Grant. Uh, uh, his father was 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 uh, European royalty. One of his other stepfathers was also European royalty. Uh, he married Jill St. John, one of the most beautiful starlets of the 60s. So he had this Hollywood aura about him, but he also had this great success in uh, uh, car racing. Yeah, fascinating guy. How about a book? Is there a book you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, I, one of my favorite books uh, kind of ties into this. It's called American Sports Car Racing in the 1950s. It's by Michael Lynch, William Edgar, and, and Ron Pavaro with a foreword by Carol Shelby. Just a fascinating history of this period of time when Lance Reventlow was, was doing his thing. It's got a lot of history and cars and people that most people might not have heard of. It's just fascinating. Yeah. And of course, Michael, he was a very, very early guest. We just recently lost Michael Lynch. Uh, he was, uh, I think, interviewed like number 20 for me here on Cars. Yeah. So uh, it's a great book. I've got a copy of that book as well uh, that I got from Michael. So. Uh, Fantastic. American sports car racing in the 1960s. You can find all these links on Mike's show notes page here on the Cars Yeah website. Just go to carsyeah.com, type in Mike Gullett, G-U-L-E-T-T, and that page will pop right up. All right, Michael, we are up to the checkered flag, and this last question can be a bit of a doozy. Today, I'm going to buy you any cool collector car on the planet. Doesn't matter 
who owns it, where it is. I'm going to park it in your garage. But there are some rules to my game that might make it a challenge for you. We'll see. One is you can't sell it to buy a bunch of other toys with. The most difficult part of this is it's the only collector car you can have. And lastly, I want you to drive it. No garage queens allowed around here. I don't think that's going to be a problem for you. What can I buy you today, Mike? Well, I think it's it's a step back in time for me. We've talked about two cars that I uh, that I have seller's remorse on, and my wife would would raise her hand vigorously for the first Tiso Grifo we have. <laughs> but I honestly, I would I would uh, do almost anything to to have my Bizzarini back. That was a special car. The original owner, who's a friend of mine now, uh, lives in uh, Pennsylvania. He owned the car. For 32 years, having bought it new in Italy and shipped it to the U.S., it just has a a special history. The original sales receipt came with the car. The original owner's manual came with the car, which is rare in the Bizzarini world. Most people I know that own a Bizzarini have never even seen an owner's manual. And it was in fabulous condition, ran like a top, fun to drive, although it was a challenge to get in and out of it. If you've ever seen one yeah. and you've seen one, <laughs> there, the yeah. roof line is only 43 inches from the ground. You have to really maneuver yourself to get in and out of that car. But And I'm six one. but once I found myself in the car, I was actually quite comfortable. Um, but getting in, getting in and out was a challenge. Actually, I did a blog post on, on, on the challenges of getting in and out of a Bizzarini. But I, you know, maybe I'm just a boring guy, but that's, I, I had it before and, and I can't imagine a better car to own. There you go. Well, Mike, you've taken me on a great ride today. Really enjoyed getting to know you better. Again, a shout out to Cindy Meidel for connecting us to here. Thank you, Cindy. And thanks for sharing your journey with us. Uh, could you offer us a little parting piece of wisdom or guidance before you drive off into the sunset in that bit serene? Oh, I, I would say that uh, my friend Bruce Meyer, uh, his, his uh, famous saying is never lift, uh, yes. which, which, which to me, which to me means keep going, don't stop, don't slow down, just keep doing what you're doing. Absolutely. Great advice. For those of you who missed my talk with Bruce Meyer, you can go back and find him on the Cars Yeah website, the quintessential car guy. And the best way for people to learn about you, of course, is mycarquest.com. I encourage you to go there. Sign up, you go, you scroll down, you can subscribe, you can get the blog. A uh, really delightful website, wonderful stories. I think you're going to enjoy this. And who knows who Mike might connect you with down the road. Mike, thanks for being so generous today with your time and expertise and for sharing your experiences with me and the listeners. Until you and I talk again, my friend, I'll see you down the road. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Hey, Mark Green here from Cars Yeah. Did you know you can now see me on the Cars Yeah TV show? It's a weekly visit to some of my past Cars Yeah podcast guests, and I take you along for the ride. You go behind the garage door and into their lives, their businesses, and you get to see what makes them successful. With tens of millions of viewers, Cars Yeah TV is making its mark. Cars Yeah TV is available on MAV TV and Lucas Oil Racing TV. You'll find MAV TV on Direct TV. Fubo TV, Fios by Verizon, or you can stream it through Lucas Oil Racing Television online. And they said I only had a face for podcasting. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!